Swami was pointing to me. What's the distance between there and here? The moment I'm wondering, so Swami asking for the physical distance, is Swami asking for something else. And then Swami said, three feet. Yes, Swami, three feet. What's the distance between here and there? I said, Swami, it, maybe it's four feet. Swami said, if this is four feet, is this also four feet? He is not some imposing God. He is not somebody who puts himself in a pedestal, but comes down to you, speaks with you, jokes with you, pulls your leg. 2007 or 2008, Swami came, stopped in front of this gentleman, lovingly asked him, How's your mother? And Swami's answer was really revealing. With pranams at Bhagwan's lotus feet, respected elders, my dear brothers and sisters, Sairam to all of you. Standing here makes me very nostalgic. Taking namaskar at this photograph reminds me of the occasions when I've taken namaskar of Swami and spoken in this very hall, whether it was as a student in the 1980s or whether it was in the 1990s speaking in this hall or speaking at the stage down, I think the Jalan Mandap as you call it. And uh, while probably I didn't feel very nervous in those days because there was Swami sitting there and you were having come with Swami to Mumbai, you were speaking as Swami's representative. Speaking in this hall today seems to make me uh, a little bit nervous, I don't know why. It's perhaps the overwhelming nature of the occasion where you are speaking as a so-called guest at the Samarpan. But having lived with Swami, having been fortunate to live with Swami for the last so many years, in fact, though I can say I am, I am from Mumbai, I have lived a greater part of my life in Vrindavan and Prashantalayam than... In Mumbai, I have lived more than two-thirds of my life there and less than one-third of my life in Mumbai. But having lived there all these years, the one realization that finally sinks in, that life with Swami is just a journey. A journey. As Swami himself says, life is a journey from I to V and V to He. So he takes us all on this journey. And what he is trying to do in this journey is probably lift us all up a few steps. Lift our consciousness from where it is to maybe slightly higher. We are all at different stages in this journey. And what he is trying to do is to push us a few steps ahead. It's up to us to capitalize on that lead and move on or to stay where we are and allow the rest of humanity to catch up with us. The journey always begins very well. The journey begins with God showering all His love on you, God making you the center of existence as if only you mattered for Him, which is how life began for me when I went as a student. Received lots of attention, received lots of love. But soon I was to realize that this attention, this love, is not because I was something special. This attention, this love, was only because I was nothing special. He wanted to make me something special. So this went on for some time. This was a phase in life when God was a friend. Let me narrate one such instance to you. Having gone from Mumbai, especially in those days, 35, 40 years ago, Parthi and Vrindavan was down south. We only knew the only thing we in Mumbai knew about the south was the wonderful idlis and dosas that we would eat in a 
ODP restaurant. I really didn't know, though I must have studied in school, that there were four states, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Andhra, Kerala, with four distinct languages. So I really couldn't make out. I couldn't make out what was Kannada, what was Telugu, what was Tamil, what was Malayalam. So much so that my friends would make fun of me. One of them would start speaking in Tamil. The other one would continue in Telugu. The third one would continue in Kannada and ask me to guess which language they are speaking in. And my state was such that if they had spoken Tamil, Telugu and Kannada, my guess would be this is Malayalam. That was what I knew. And soon it was obvious to Swami, I shouldn't use the word obvious, Swami knew that I didn't know any of these languages. So he would speak to me in his sweet, beautiful Hindi. And I would answer back in a mix of Hindi and English. So in that state, one day we had, we were all, we found ourselves present in one room in, in Brindavan, in Swami's old bungalow in Brindavan. That room was nicknamed by the students as a safe room. It was called a safe room because, not because there was anything safe about it. Life around Swami is always safe. And in another sense, I'll come to it a little later, life around Swami is never safe. But this room had a big huge safe and we don't know, but people say that when Swami acquired that property in 1964 and started living there, the room was built around the safe which was already present there. So we were there in that room, there were probably 15-20 of us. I was a student, a few students, a few senior students. Some of our teachers were also there. There was this venerable gentleman who was still there in Puttaparthi, Professor Nanjundaya, who happened to be my teacher in Vrindavan at that time. I am told that he's come and spoken in Samarpan some months ago, or some, a couple of years ago. So, he happened to be standing there. And Swami was conversing with various people. Very often in, most often in Telugu, I presumed. And occasionally too with people like me in Hindi. Swami was on and off asking me some questions. Very, very normal questions. Swami's way is to make you feel that he is speaking to you. It's not the information that he wants. He doesn't need to know who you are or for what your name or which place you came from and so on. But those, those are his ways of making you feel special, making you feel recognized. So here he was on and off asking me also some questions about myself, about from where I come, about my parents and so on. And this was going on. Swami was speaking with various others including Prasanna Anjunda and Telugu. And then the question, the questioning became a little more detailed. He asked me what I was studying. So I explained to him, I said, Swami, I'm studying commerce. So what, what subjects do you have? So I mentioned my subjects. Naturally for a commerce student, one of the most common subjects, prominent subjects is accounts, accounting. So I said, Swami, accounts. And President Anjanaya happened to be standing almost next to me. Slightly, maybe three feet, four feet away. So I said, Swami accounts and so on. Who are your teachers? I later realized that actually Swami wanted me to mention Prasanna Anjundaya, which I did. Because Swami said, who are your teachers? And he happened to be the only one who was actually standing in that room. So I mentioned two, three names. I said, Swami, Prasanna Anjundaya also. What does he teach you? Now this was not a continuous conversation. This was an on and off conversation. I'm just trying to shorten it by telling you the whole story. So he would say something to me, then say something to someone else, then say something to person Anjundaya, and then he would come back to me. So, who are your teachers, person Anjundaya? So what does he teach you? He teaches me, Swami, he teaches me accounts. Okay. And then, which subject do you like? 
Now, accounts was a subject which, which has been my favorite since I took commerce in college. And so I said, Swami, accounts is the subject which I love. He asked Professor Anjinda whether I am a student. Said, yes, Swami, he is my student. Now, I was a student who, was, who loved accounts and therefore was always good at accounts. Typically, if you learn to like something, you learn to love something, you are likely to be good at it. And I was good at accounts. So, I was very enthusiastic about it. And luckily for me, I was happy because soon the conversation turned to marks. So, I was very happy. He said, uh, you like accounts? You said you like accounts. Yes, Swami, I like accounts. How many marks did you get? That was the question which I was very happy to hear because just a week before that, we had a test. And in that test, that was a class test. That was a 20 mark test. And uh, I happened to get 20 out of 20. So you feel very happy when somebody like Swami asks you how many marks you got and very enthusiastically beaming, I said, Swami, I got 20 out of 20. Mm -hmm. No enthusiasm. I am very happy I got 20 out of 20. Swami looked at uh, Professor Nanjundaya and said, hmm, what do you have to say? Silence. Then, Swami said, you got 20 out of 20, but you are good in accounts? I said, yes, Swami, I am good in accounts. Uh, previous test, how much you got? I said, Swami, previous, last month also we had a test, I got 20 out of 20. Before that also, now here I was exceeding myself. So I said, Swami, before that also, when we had the midterm test, I got 50 out of 50. I was not asked for that information. But then such, is, such information you always like to volunteer. So I said, Swami, we had midterm test three months back or four months back. Uh, there also I got 50 out of 50. So Swami turns to Professor Nanjundaya and asks him, is it? He says he got 20 out of 20, 50 out of 50, is it? Swami, actually I don't remember. Catch a teacher anywhere, not remembering a student who's got 20 out of 20, 50 out of 50, not in one test but consistently. I used to pride myself if I've got 49 out of 50, something is wrong with the question paper. So, here was this gentleman saying, Swami, I don't remember. I was wondering why he's saying like that. I was a little annoyed also because I, I'm sure there's someone here who's either been a teacher or who's had somebody in, or who, all of us have been students and we all know that a teacher typically, invariably is a soft corner for a student who's good in studies. Whatever else may be the story. So here I was very good in this, in this particular subject, always getting top marks in that subject. And here was a teacher who I knew had a soft corner for me. Uh, we had very good relations and here he was saying, I don't remember. Is it? He says he doesn't remember. Now what can I say? Now I had, it was my turn to keep quiet. I was boasting too much, so now it was my turn to keep quiet. Then uh, he says, uh, you, you like accounts, right? Which other subjects you like? So then I, I, I mentioned something. But somehow the conversation came back to accounts. So, so again Swami said, uh, you, you like accounts, but you are good at accounts. So here I said, of course Swami, that's why I am getting 20 out of 20, 50 out of 50. So Swami again goes back to Prasanna Anjundaya and says, uh, he's a, he says he's a good student. No Swami. You normally never tell in front of Swami, even if today, I've been teaching for so many years, if the parent of a student came and asked me how his son was studying, I would not start by saying he's a bad student. Even if he's a bad student, I'd probably start by saying he needs to put in more effort, he can get better marks, he's not realizing his potential. I mean, you would say that to a parent, here is somebody who's telling Swami, no, Swami is a bad student. 
So I was going red, blue, green and it probably showed on my face. And uh, I was so annoyed that uh, Swami again turns to me and says, he is saying he is a bad student with a little bit of vigor in my voice and anger and annoyance in my voice. I said, Swami, I don't know why he is saying that. I had the temerity to say that. I said, Swami, I don't know why he is saying that. Swami continued the conversation. Actually, I am trying to narrate the story in a condensed form. The conversation continued. Finally, Swami turned and said, Look, see, if he is saying that uh, you are not a good student, you are a bad student, there must be something wrong, right? Now, I was totally not merely flustered. I began by being flustered, but I was angry. So, I said, I don't know Swami. Swami should ask him. So, Swami decided, it's time to teach this guy a lesson. So, Swami said, Nanjundaya, he is saying uh, he is getting full marks and very good marks and he is very good at the subject. And you are saying Swami is a bad student. Yes, Swami, he is a bad student. I don't know how he is getting these marks. But he is getting these marks, right? So, how is he getting these marks? Maybe Swami is copying. That was like the final straw. What do you have to say to that? He looked at me kind of, you know, what do you have to say to that? I was a mixture of downright angry, upset, everything. I couldn't say anything and I didn't know what to say. So, I just kept silent but my face was shaking. And then Swami turned to Professor Nanjundaya and said, Nanjundaya, you say he is copying, then what are you doing as a teacher? <laughs> Saying that he got up from his seat and meanwhile, everybody in the room was smiling and giggling and Swami was also giggling. So, as he said this, Nanjundaya, what are, if he is copying, what are you doing as a teacher? He said that and walked out of the room and everybody in the room burst into laughter. He himself, Swami himself was laughing and he walked out of the room. Since Swami walked out of the room, he walked out of the room from the main door. Everybody else trooped out, in the room, out of the room from the side door. I was left wondering what's happening. I had no clue what was happening. Everybody is laughing away. People are looking at me and laughing even more. So, I of course had realized that I had made a fool of myself. Uh, that is nothing new for me, but I was wondering why, what, what was exactly that had happened. Finally, so I kept asking some people, what happened, what happened, why is everybody laughing? And nobody would reply, everybody was running out because Swami had gone out, so everybody was running behind Swami. Finally, one person decided to take pity on me. And this was, you know, one of my four friends, I told you of the practical joke that they would play on me. Or they would pull my leg by, you know, one starting in Kannada, one starting in Tamil, the other one continuing in the third language and I would invariably, without fail, guess if they had spoken three languages, I would guess the fourth. She says, remember uh, the game that we play with you? I will speak in Tamil, Harish will speak in Kannada, Shiva will speak in Telugu and you will say Malayalam. Swami so, did exactly that with you today. What was happening was, Swami was carrying on this conversation, knowing fully well that I know, I don't even know with the language, I mean, I guess the language is Telugu because Swami is speaking it. But otherwise I can't recognize Telugu. So what Swami was doing is, He was asking me something. Meanwhile, He was carrying on a parallel conversation with Professor Nanjundaya and telling him, I am going to ask this, you answer like this. <laughs> so I am going to ask, how is he getting, or... He says he is good. You say he is a bad student. This whole conversation was going on and there were many people in the room who, are, who knew Telugu, who were as fluent in Telugu for them. It was the mother tongue. And I was among the only people in the room who had no clue of what was happening. So this is Swami. I am narrating this incident because this is Swami who is very much your friend. When among children, I am a child. So this is the Swami who begins life with you as your friend. He is not some imposing God. He is not somebody who puts himself in a pedestal. But comes down to you. Comes down to your level. Speaks with you. 
jokes with you, pulls your leg, scolds you also when required, teaches you lessons to a student, he would teach lessons in a very, very simple and straightforward way. I remember sometime when I was a student and like I, I told you, life began very rosily with me. This was one of the incidents during that rosy phase when everything seemed to be going right with me. Okay. And I, I, I got a lot of attention. And then one fine day, I just didn't get any attention. I was a no one in that room. I would stand there. Swami would walk past. Swami would take letters or Swami would speak to the person on my left, the person on my right, the person behind me. It was as if I just didn't exist. We were sitting in a group like this. He would come, one day distributing shirts. So he would give to everybody. But somehow, very casually, miss giving me that shirt. So there are 30 people in the room, you can be sure there are 29 shirts. So I went through that. It was only much later I realized that if I went through that, it was only because I was neither the center of existence, all existence, nor was I nobody in existence. I had to find myself. I had to allow him to enter my life. I had to allow him to enter my, my, my head. I had to allow him to enter my heart. And if he had to enter my head and enter my heart, I had to learn to empty it of all that this world had taught me. That period when I didn't exist, or probably I existed like one of those flower pots around the place, that was the period where I was searching inside me why I didn't exist. He didn't point out. He allowed me to search for myself. He allowed me to find out for myself and empty all that was wrong. Not that the process is over, a lot of it is still left. But he allowed me to find for myself. He allows each one of us to walk at our own pace. We have to decide whether we want to walk forward and at what pace whether we, we want to walk or whether we are going to remain in the same place. Unfortunately, many of us after some time decide it's very convenient to remain in the same place. If we decide it's very convenient to remain in the same place, he allows us to remain in the same place. The end of that period came in a very simple way and a lesson which I will not forget for the rest of my life. He had not spoken to me for a long time, probably two months. Two months in Swami's presence is a very long time. Especially in those days when there were a handful of students always around Swami. So two months, he is treating you like one of the pillars or flower pots around. It is a very, very long time and a very painful time. And one day suddenly, he was sitting and we were all standing. So I was standing. And he suddenly turned to me and asked, What's the distance between, he pointed to himself, what's the, dist what's the distance between there and here? I didn't understand the question. What's the distance between there and here? So the moment I'm wondering, is Swami asking for the physical distance? Is Swami asking for something else? I couldn't find anything deeper to that question. So after a lot of thinking, Swami repeated that question two, three times, very graphically. First time he said, what's the distance between there and here? Second time, what's the distance between there, kind of pointing to where I was standing, pointing to my feet, between there and here. So finally I mumbled, three feet. And then Swami said, three feet? So my mind, not still tuned into Swami's wavelength, I thought maybe I got my measurements wrong. So I said, Swami, maybe four feet. Three feet, four feet, distance is three feet. Yes, Swami, three feet. What's the distance between here and there? Now, at least I was sure Swami is talking of distance feet. 
सो आई सेड स्वामी थ्री फीट स्वामी सर आयुष्य आई सेड स्वामी इट मे बी इट्स फोर फीट सो स्वामी सेड इफ दिस इज फोर फीट इज दिस ऑल्सो फोर फीट आई सेड आई फोल्डेड माई हैंड्स बट कुंड रिज इज सेंग स्वामी इट शुड बी सो विथ फोल्डेड हैंड्स आई सेड स्वामी इट शुड बी then swami repeated said if the distance between and this time which i realized i didn't realize at that moment of time because i kept thinking about it maybe a few hours later i realized swami is no longer pointing to my feet swami is pointing to me the distance between there and here is 3 feet the distance between here and there is also 3 feet swami said that and paused probably realized that this dull headed thick guy wouldn't have really understood so he said whatever the distance you think between you and me the same is the distance between me and you if you think you are far you are far if you think you are near you are near so this was swami's way of saying don't be despondent just because i have not spoken to you simple lessons very profound statements but very profound statements put put to you in a language which you will understand in a manner in which things would go home but then when the journey begins he begins by making you comfortable but ultimately he is the teacher and as a teacher he wants you to learn i don't know whether the lessons are painful for the student or not but like swami himself said i alone know how difficult it is to teach you each step of the dance it's not raja alone who knows how difficult it is to teach so if the lessons were difficult to the student it was even more difficult to the dance master but dance master that he was all his life he kept teaching all his life he kept teaching hoping to take you forward on that journey make to help you to make the take that first step from i to we a good part of his life was spent in teaching us that we need to move beyond i because as we have grown up we've all been conditioned to think of me mine me my mine everything comes everything about us whether it's people whether it is property whether it is money whether it is physical objects everything comes with that a word before it my brother my family my father my property mine so i do something for what is mine i do something else for what is not mine so i lived his life teaching teaching us nothing is mine in one sense the whole world is mine in another sense and he taught it very very practically let me tell you another incident which i learned the hard way this was sometime in the early 90s the setting was kodai canal so i would take a group of students with him to kodai canal in the early days it would be a very small group of 15 20 people slowly it got enlarged so i was one of those fortunate enough to be part of that group like a loving father he would one day you know tell the boys go he would give money and say go shopping so the boys would go shopping and then you know he would want them to go and buy something because you go home so buy something for your mother or brother or father or sister or grandparents so the boys would go shopping he'd give he'd give give them money some of them won't spend that money because that's a note given by swami so i want to treasure it and he would get annoyed so no i gave you money to go and buy so then they would go buy some things so and then you know typically like at home what we would do is you buy something and so you show it you have an elderly grandmother so you show her i bought this for you or so you say what did you buy and he would see 
So he found that many of these boys had bought a plain gents shawl which was very nice and soft. And quite a few boys said one after another, I bought it for my father, I bought it for my uncle, I bought it for my grandfather. And that pattern seemed to be repeating. Okay. So that session was over. All the boys were sent back up to get ready for the evening bhajan. Swami was in the room, I was standing in one corner. Suddenly Swami asked me, you saw that shawl? Because quite a few had repeated, I presumed that Swami, I said, Swami, that plain shawl, yes. Go and buy hundred of them. I'll take them with me to Pataparthi. Very nice to give people. You know, when Swami has a program, he would give people, on some occasion he would give people. So he said, go and buy hundred. And uh, we'll take it to Parthi. Uh, it'll be good for me to give. It's nice to give. I said, okay, Swami. Then he went in, he came back. He came with some money, gave me, gave me the money and said, you buy 200. I said, okay. As soon as Swami went uh, for bhajan, I set off for the market. You know, Swami said, these are from the Tibetans. So there's a, like most hill stations, would have these Tibetans putting up stalls. So there was this colony of Tibetans having a row of stalls selling these woolen or woolen articles. So I said, buy from those Tibetans. I said, yes, Swami. I went to those Tibetan shops. I naturally didn't want to say I've come for 200 shawls. So I asked for the price of one, tried to bargain. Then I said, what if I buy 20? What if I buy 50? It actually turned out that they didn't have so much of stock. So then I thought I'll go around buying whatever stock a person has, 5 for one, 10 from one, 15 from another. I need to collect 200. But I needed to be sure that all 200 were the same or similar stuff. Could be different colors, but they were the same or similar stuff. So I went from shop to shop. I finished the entire row of Tibetans. The surprising thing was that they all held on to the price. In fact, in at least a couple of shops, uh, yes, I, I want to buy this shawl, okay, 100 rupees. I mean, I'm talking of 25 years ago. 100 rupees meant something in those days, not today. So, 100 rupees. I said, what if I buy 25 of them? You know what is the answer? 110. You would expect, how much is this shawl? 100 rupees. What if I buy 20 of them? You expect them to come down to 90 or 80. Here is this guy saying 110. A few shops later, same answer. What if I buy 10? What if I buy 20? The third shopkeeper who gave me the answer, I was a little, I was wondering what's wrong. So third shopkeeper who gave me that answer, I said, something is wrong with you guys. For one shawl you give, you say 100. And when I say 20 shawls, you say 110. Then he, he revealed. He said, Saab, kisi ke paas stock nahi hai. No one has stock here. So if you take off everything, we want a higher price. I said, I still didn't understand. Sir, we will take 100 from you because you are an Indian. You will bargain. When a foreigner comes, we will take 200 from him. He said that. He said, when a Gora comes, we will take 200 from him. He doesn't know. He is paying in dollars. So if you take away my entire stock, you think I am gaining, I am actually losing. I said, these guys are mm, very smart businessmen. Okay. So, mentally I thought, I didn't say anything. Mentally I thought, if you guys think you are smart businessmen, I mean even a smarter businessman. I will now start trying to find out from where you get those shawls. Because they all have similar products. They are not weaving these shawls. So, they are getting it from somewhere. So, now... I said, look, I want uh, 50 shawls. Tomorrow morning, will I, will you give me? No, sir, I tried to change my tack. I said, I want 50 shawls, will you give me? No, sir, we don't have. I said, how soon can you get me? I started asking different questions. To cut a long story short, 
I finally managed to get the information out from them that they all get it from a factory which is about 40 kilometers away in a particular place. So, you know, I said, how, how soon can you get them? So, one fellow said, day after tomorrow. I said, no, I want it tomorrow morning, at least you should get me. Mm, this is not tomorrow morning, but I'll try. I have to get it from where? I have to get it from far. Okay. So, like that it went. So, next fellow, I said, I said, look, I'm leaving Kodai Canal tomorrow afternoon. Sir, it's physically not possible. I have to get it from this place. So, like that I got the name of the place out from where they get. Some more inquiries and finally I found out. I thought I was being really smart. I really found out from where they get those shawls. So, there was a particular factory which was 40 kilometers away down from where they were all getting. Now, can I really get from there? They don't have stock. What if the factory doesn't have a stock? So, I went back to Sai Shruti. I was thinking I will not report anything to Swami, I will keep quiet. And I kept quiet, Swami also kept quiet. So, I was very happy. Because now what to tell Swami, I was wondering in my mind. How do I plan now? So these guys are all acting funny. They are not going to give me the 200 shawls even at 100 rupees. And basically common sense says if I can buy one shawl for 100, I should be able to buy 200 shawls for whatever, 90, 80, 75 but definitely not for 110. Maximum, these guys will give me the shawls for 100 rupees. I am not willing to buy 200 shawls for 100 rupees when they are selling even one shawl for 100 rupees. So that was my pride with saying, why should I be paying 100 rupees for 200 shawls? Now what do I tell Swami? Do I tell Swami, Swami, there is this factory, I will get it from them. Or should I get it from the factory? I was wondering how to get it from the factory. I can't leave Kodai Canal without Swami's permission. And in those days, today there is a big organization there, there are Seva Dal there, there are people there. In those days, there, was, there were very few Seva Dals who would come from some district or the other, some local devotees. So, the network was not so strong. So, next day morning, I spoke to the state president at that time. Uh, and I asked him. General Mahadevan was the state president, so I asked General Mahadevan, I said, sir, he said, I don't know, I'll find out. He also didn't know, I said, is someone coming from this place? He said, I'll find out. He didn't get back the whole day, whole of the next day he didn't get back. So I concluded he is not able to, obviously he is finding it difficult to find some sevadal there, he doesn't have information. So, I caught hold of another elderly gentleman who was from Coimbatore, who was also regularly coming to Kadaikanal and looking after all the arrangements there. He has passed away now. Mr. Sajiranandam, I said, Sir, can you get me this? He said, we'll find somebody who will get. Now, in all this, two days are over. So, after, on the second day, I found Swami was looking at me. So, I presumed Swami is wondering why I have not reported back to him. He has asked me to do an assignment, he has even given me money. So, I looked at Swami and I, I also didn't know what to say, I smiled. So, Swami said, yeah, Mahinda. By now, I had picked up a little bit of Telugu. So, Swami said, yeah, Mahinda. So, I knew what Swami was talking about. I said, Swami, it is like this, I went round the market. All these Tibetans are acting very funny. And they are saying, we'll give you one shawl at 100 rupees and if you want... I said, Swami, nobody has 200 shawls. Eh, you can buy 20, 20 from 10 people and get 200, Swami said. I said, Swami, that's what I thought I'll do. But the moment I tell somebody that I want 20 shawls, he's saying he's going to charge me 110 rupees. So, I didn't buy from these Tibetans. Then what are you going to do? I said, Swami, I just managed to find out that there is a factory at this particular place called Porur, which is 40 kilometers from the foothills of Kodai Canal. And all of them are getting shawls from this factory. And uh, I have inquired what the price from the factory is. And the factory is just got a reply this morning that the factory will give us the shawls at 70 rupees. I was very happy that I was buying that shawl, which is these people would have given at 100, if not 110. I was now buying it for 70 and I am sure anybody in this hall here 
who has done business in his life will agree that any businessman will say cut the middleman go to the original source anybody who has dealt with money and all of us have dealt with money will say we should never spend more than if we can buy something cheaper we should buy something cheaper so here I was actually for two days I had made lots of phone calls, caught hold of a lot of people, made lots of inquiries and finally managed to get this information. And here I was trying to put the plan into place, saying now who will go to Porur, get those shawls and bring it. And I said, now anyway, two days are over, I have not reported to Swami. When the shawls actually come, I will report to Swami, Swami, here are the shawls. And then I will tell Swami, Swami, it took four days to get or five days to get because we had to get them from this factory which was here. But I was very happy anyway, now that Swami is asked. And Swami didn't ask till my information was in place. Till all my inquiries had borne fruit, He didn't ask. And I kept quiet. I thought I will get a pat on the back. You have done something very good. Because I thought, I genuinely thought I had done something very good. I am saving a lot of money. Okay. So here I was as a Swami, we will now get it instead of paying this price, we will now be able to get it for this price. It will come Swami in the next two days. I got the firing of my life. Didn't I tell you to go and buy from those Tibetans? You are a very mean man. You can think only in terms of money. You measure everything in terms of money. And I am just telling you the sum and substance of what Swami said. The actual firing was much longer and had so many more things. You can think only in terms of money. Do you realize these Tibetans, how devoted they are to me? And then he narrated an incident for which my only answer was tears. Some of the photos that we saw in the slideshow here, when bhajans were going on, was a visit which Swami had made to Kashmir in the year 1980. So he said, when I had gone to Kashmir, we went to the market, and Swami himself had also gone, I believe. We went to the market, and these Tibetans, we all bought shawls from them. Everybody bought shawls. When I looked at a particular shawl and I liked that shawl, I told somebody to buy that shawl. They went to buy that shawl and this Tibetan said, we will not take money for this shawl, we would like to give this shawl to Swami. How they found out that the shawl would go to Swami is inexplicable. But for Swami, this was a link, he narrated that story. He said, when I went to Kashmir in 1980, this is what they did. You don't need these Tibetans, they have been displaced from their motherland. They have no place of their own to call their own. They have come down to India. Why do you think they have come down to Kodaikanal? You think they can eat sambar? I fully agreed because on the first day in the hostel, when I was given rasam rice, I refused to go for dinner. You think they can eat sambar? They are staying here only, they have to earn their livelihood, they have no home of their own. You think I need these shawls? My storerooms in Puttaparthi are full. I don't have to buy anything. Devotees send me lots of things. I am just buying these 200 shawls from these people only to make them happy, only to fill their stomachs. And here you are, you can measure my gesture only in terms of money. Go right now, buy those shawls at whatever price and come. And here I was, I didn't pay 100 rupees for the shawl, I didn't pay 110 rupees for the shawl, I paid an average of 160 rupees for the shawl. Five days later, after I thought I'll get it from a factory at 70 rupees a shawl. Of course, I was ready to pay 160 because if I had gone back to Sai Shruti without those shawls, I don't know whether I would have been allowed to stay there that night. So here is Swami who looks at the heart. Here is Swami who looks at your intent. 
and not the money the same swami who believes that every rupee of charitable money which comes to him must be used properly every penny that comes into the trust would have to be used in such a way that the donor's confidence in giving it to swami was well well justified it is the same swami for whom the tibetans were just one part of his large family so here was swami who was teaching us the lesson that i learned that day was that for swami it is the love of his devotee which matters more than anything else for swami anybody in trouble anybody in difficulty he would rescue in his own way we need to realize that and that brings me to another incident which also happened in kodaikanal this was a few years later i have narrated that in other forums other places so some of you have heard it in some recorded versions please excuse me but i think it's left such an imprint on me that i'll repeat it swami so would do narayan seva whenever he was in kodaikanal and typically narayan seva everywhere wherever narayan seva takes place we would invariably distribute even i'm sure when you do narayan seva in dharmakshetra you would distribute food on some occasions distribute clothes so all the needy people or the poor people would get a sari or a dhoti or whatever some clothes and food in kodaikanal it would be being a cold place being a hill station it would be a sari or a dhoti for the ladies or the gents and a blanket so this was ishwaramma day and narayan seva was scheduled for that day so typically there we have a bhajan hall like this so in the bhajan hall all the food would be kept all the clothes would be kept from the bhajan hall the distribution would take place so all the food would be you know passed out by the students and the elders and others and then given to the so on one side would all be the devotees for whom for whom the same food is distributed they are very happy to receive it as prasadam and in another part of the compound the so called narayanas would be seated to whom the food would be given and the clothes would be given so here was this distribution going on 2 hours 3 hours the distribution was going on the distribution was almost over and swami walked into the bhajan hall so swami was there behind him a couple of elders were there swami had he had been walking up and down almost the whole morning supervising the rayan seva distributing clothes standing seeing to it seeing the devotees enjoying the prasadam giving darshan to them so he had walked around quite a bit so there was that tired look on swami's face crumpled clothes swami was slightly sweaty but when he walked into the bhajan hall he came and he saw a pile of blankets there there was some food he spoke to the sevadal people very lovingly inquired from them whether they had their prasadam whether they had food prasadam they said no swami we finished distribution yes swami we just finished distribution so he instructed them all of you must first have prasadam have your food then do the cleaning and came forward he saw the blankets so he turned and asked blankets were not distributed so he looked around in general and asked so two three of us including some of the elders we said i said swami blankets are distributed one of the elders said swami blankets were distributed so he turned to the gentleman behind him okay let me take his name mr shrinivasan who just passed away last month i uh, turned to mr shrinivasan and asked him mr swami blankets were distributed everybody got yes swami everybody got go and see swami told him so this gentleman went went out 2 minutes over 3 minutes over 5 minutes over he is not yet come back so swami was restless he was moving around talking but his eyes kept going on to that pile of blankets there then uh, finally he turned and spotted me he said near the gate uh, 
were these blankets given? Poi chudu, near the gate, charu. So, as I was running out of the bhajan hall, there's a flight of steps leading up to the bhajan hall. So, as I was moving out, running out of the bhajan hall, Mr. Srinivasan was coming up the steps. So, I said, Sir, Swami is asking whether it is given. Yes, 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 I checked up. No, I, I said, Sir, outside the gate was it given? He said, Yes, yes, I checked up everywhere it was given. I said, No, sir, Swami is just asking. So, when he said everywhere it was given, I also stopped and he was coming up, so I also turned. I thought behind him, I'll follow. Then he said, he said, no, Swami is saying specifically outside the gate, let's go and check. So both of us went. We climbed down the steps, climbed down, climbed down that entire slope of Sai Shruti, went to the gate. We walked out of the gate, there was a watchman there, there was some sevadal on duty. We asked them, they said, yes, people came here, they gave whoever was sitting here also was given. Because sometimes what happens is, people who come late get seated outside the gate, they're not allowed to come inside. Or if the crowd is overflowing, there are some people who are outside the gate. So maybe people who are inside were given the clothes and the blankets, the people outside were not given the blankets. So we asked quite a few people, we saw some old people with sticks, but they seemed to have blankets in their hand. So we spent a good five minutes finding out and finally we walked back. By the time we reached the bhajan hall, Swami had left the bhajan hall. The bhajan hall is connected to Swami's residence internally, just like the arrangement here where you can walk in and you know, you go to the offices and the stage. So that there also there's internal connection between the bhajan hall and the this thing. So Swami had walked from the bhajan hall into his residence. Meanwhile what had happened was, you know students had all run ahead in anticipation of Swami, washed their hands and feet because they were all doing Narayan Seva, dirty hands, dirty feet. So they had washed their hands and feet and then gone and sat around Swami's chair. So there was this cluster of students around Swami's chair. The Swami walked in clearly, and he had walked for two, three hours. So as he sat on the chair, he said, I'm thirsty. In Telugu he said, after so many years my Telugu is still, I, I know a little bit of Telugu, but it's not so good for me to try and say that in Telugu. So he said, I'm thirsty. So one of the students, and later he said, I was hesitating whether I should offer water to Swami. But when Swami said, I am thirsty, promptly he picked up the glass of water which was kept on the stool next to Swami's chair and offered it to Swami. And as that glass of water came up, and Swami saw that glass of water, Swami brushed, out, brushed him aside like this, not this, he said. Swami was looking tired. He had walked around for two, three hours. Anyone who's seen Swami for long, will know that a glass of water is kept next to Swami's stool. He takes water at regular intervals. And here for 2-3 hours he has been walking around. The icing on the cake is, while sitting he said, I am thirsty. He said it very softly, not too many people would have heard. But at least the boys who were sitting there swear that he said, I am thirsty. So this boy naturally felt that, you know, his attempt at giving water was rejected. So, he was crestfallen and Swami was sitting silently. When we entered, Mr. Srinivasan and I was trailing behind him, when we entered the room, we saw that Swami sitting silently with that far away look. So, neither of us attempted to say anything, I just sat down. At the first available blank spot, I sat down. Uh, Mr. Srinivasan crossed over and on the chairs, he would normally sit. He found a place. Swami saw him, saw, saw both of us coming in. I sat down. In fact, he couldn't have gone unnoticed because he crossed over. But Swami didn't say anything. He also kept quiet. Swami had that lost, far away look in his eyes. He got up and then went into the kitchen. So, Mr. Srinivasan got up. You could make out that he was in two minds because there was that far, lost, far away look. In fact, what I was thinking and a couple of others including him later when we compared notes, we were all thinking something seems to have gone wrong somewhere. Because Swami's got that, you know, far away look, unhappy look and anything can go wrong. Maybe the Narayan Seva distribution didn't go on properly. Maybe uh, somebody made some kind of a mistake. Swami is very, very particular about ladies and gents. So when there is this running around distribution going on, 
boys are running especially if his boys any kind of mingling between ladies and guests anybody who's been in the organization for even a few years would know that and have would have learnt that so any kind of intermingling oh, he is touchy about if it's a students or he is even more touchy something like that must have happened somebody would have you know spoken to some lady or some lady would have asked nothing has been given there please go there and give and swami would have seen that you know our shallow minds started thinking on these lines or maybe somebody has spilt some food you know, swami this is prasadam you can't spill it worse if you spill it on to somebody somebody's clothes so something could have happened now what has happened how would we know what has happened so we were all thinking that something has gone wrong so swami walked in so mr nasan got up and he followed swami he walked two steps and he turns to me and says call comes calls come come i had no choice but to follow i didn't want to follow i had no choice but to follow i followed we walked into the kitchen what swami had done was he had walked through the kitchen there's a devotee of uh, swami whom many of you would might know or would have heard about a lady by name mrs ratan lal who had the opportunity to serve swami for many many years she also passed away uh, this march so she was sitting there in the kitchen and very unlike swami swami walked past without even looking at her so as we walked in she asked me what happened kya hua i said i don't know and she said swami walked like that seems to be upset at something what happened i said i have no clue and she seized on me she said no you guys your boys would have done something you are trying to hide i said auntie i have no clue what has happened we want to know what has happened that's why we have we have also come inside you know because sometimes swami would in a private conversation he would let out some steam or he would say something now all we could see we didn't have the guts to go out actually what had happened was swami had gone through the kitchen and there was something like an outer kitchen you know a covered place where some more utensils would be kept and some some things would be stored and things like that so swami had come and the outer kitchen had a naturally a door which would lead you completely outside so that door was open and swami was literally standing in the door doorway so the door was blocked you couldn't see what was happening there because swami's frame was in the door so all you could see was swami's back obviously swami was talking to somebody but you couldn't see who swami was talking to who was there on that side we had no clue we were wondering what is happening so swami spoke to whoever he was speaking for a couple of minutes and then turned and came back so we were standing so there was ratnalal aunty sitting there a little away from him on one wall mr shrinivasan was standing on this wall i was standing three decorative pieces in the kitchen swami walked past us he didn't even look we obviously would have seen but didn't even look the same far away look in his eyes so now we concluded that something has really gone wrong there's something somebody has done unknowingly unwittingly which has upset him he walked out and went back into his chair so we followed now we can't stay here with swami in an upset mood we don't want to do anything which will upset him more or which will provoke him so both of us walked out and we quietly went and sat after about 3 4 or maybe 5 minutes we heard the sound of a vehicle which turned out to be swami's car uh, coming to the portico and then uh, we found uh, the gentleman who would drive swami i think it would be wrong to call him swami's driver a gentleman by name uh, padmanabhan who had the opportunity to drive swami's car so padmanabhan comes uh, to the front door pokes his head inside swami sees him and he disappears just like telling swami i am here he doesn't open his mouth just shows his head and swami sees him and he goes out and then swami gets up and swami goes to the door as he goes to the door he looks back and then calls a couple of these elders mr shrinivasan and somebody else and calls them kind of and follow me so they also troop out everybody is wondering what's happening nobody is any clue it so turned up that swami turned out that swami sat in the car and went these people also sat in the car so we wondering what has happened but anyway in one way we were happy that swami has gone out 
Because now Swami is in the car with two elders, which means whatever has gone wrong, at least he will share it with them. It will come out, we'll know. What's wrong, we can make amends for that. So there was this white jeep. By then the security system had started. So there was this white jeep in front and Swami's car behind. So white jeep had a couple of people who would act as so-called security. I'm saying so-called security because it sounds a little bit of an anachronism to think that Swami needs, God needs security. But then there was this white jeep and Swami's car and the two vehicles went. After two vehicles went, everybody continued to be seated where they are. Can you imagine a group of 25 or 30 youngsters, school and college students sitting silently in a room where there is nobody around to mind them, nobody to tell them anything, but pin drop silence even when Swami is not there. So you can guess the mood that was prevalent in that room. I also went and sat. Whoever was there just sat. Because we didn't know what to do. Nobody was looking at each other. Nobody. Then finally I got up and one of the other elders also got up and asked, Boys, anything happened today? Did you do this? Did you do that? Did somebody spill some food? Did somebody venture unknowingly on the lady's side? Did somebody talk to somebody? Did Swami find you? doing something wrong, did Swami scold you? We asked all kinds of questions that we could think of. Because in our shallow minds it was like somebody has done something which he shouldn't have done and therefore Swami is upset. We asked all kinds of questions but we we only got blank answers. So we sat down. Normally Swami would very often go for a drive in Kodaikanal and that could be 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Today it's 45 minutes, it's one hour, close to one hour and Swami has not come back. Finally, close to one hour, around 50-55 minutes, and we heard the sound of these vehicles come back. This was one kind of a relief. Vehicle came back, Swami's car came back, Swami's car would drive up all the way to the portico, literally in front of the front door. Now, on occasions like this, the students would rush to open Swami's door. It's a chance. You open Swami's door, you're doing something for Swami, you get to look at Swami, chances are Swami will look at you. So whoever was close will go and whoever reaches there first will open Swami's car door. Then nobody ventured. Nobody got up from where they were seated. Suddenly I realized that nobody is there to open Swami's door. There's no Sevadal also, because the Sevadal have all, they were all busy with the Narayan Seva, so they are busy cleaning. Because they have to clean the bhajan hall, the bhajan hall has to be ready for the evening bhajan. So everybody is out there cleaning the bhajan hall or cleaning the area where the devotees, so not even a Sevadal is standing at the front door. So very reluctantly I got up, not because I wanted to have the pleasure of opening Swami's car door, but more as a sense of duty I went. I didn't have a choice, I went. And I reached just in time. It's like I went and stood there and Swami's car stopped and I reached forward and pulled the car door open. So here was Swami getting down from the car. So he saw the car door open and as he is getting down, he is looking up at me and giving me one of the most beautiful smiles that I have received from him directly in my life. This was the same Swami who had one hour back a very far away look in his eyes and we all thought that one of us present there has committed some kind of unpardonable sin. There was gloom everywhere. He was not talking to anyone. And here he was giving one of the most beautiful smiles. After having lived with Swami for so many years, I had still not learnt. They say, the face is the index of the mind. So I had, seeing that smile, I should have smiled back. But seeing that smile, I was so wonderstruck that I had a stupefied look on my face. That is what 
The other people who were inside the car were telling me later, why did you have that stupefied look on your face? I said, I was stunned with that smile. And therefore I had that stupefied uh, look on my face. Swami reacted to that. As he got down from the car and he walked past, he gave me a pat on my cheek and went. Then you stupid fellow. He gave me a pat on my cheek and went inside. He went inside and sat. No word was being exchanged. Because the boys here have not seen that smile also. Finally, after two, three minutes of silence, as Swami sat down, he said in Telugu, Ippude na daham tirindi. Now my thirst is quenched. And everybody wondered what it is. So everybody was looking around wondering what it is. So Swami saw that look on everybody's face. So Swami told one of, told Mr. Srinivasan, uh-huh. Chipu, tell boys what had happened. To cut a long story short, what Swami had done was, seeing that pile of blankets, he had felt that these blankets were not distributed. So when he asked us to verify, we went and told him, no Swami, blankets were distributed to whoever was there. So Swami had walked up out of the kitchen, opened the kitchen door, told whoever was there to call Padmanabhan. Padmanabhan came, that's why Swami was standing there for a few minutes. Padmanabhan came. Swami instructed Padmanabhan, take all those blankets which are there in the bhajan hall, load them up in the jeep, make the jeep ready, bring the car and come. What Swami had done was, taken all those blankets, driven around Kodai Canal, all the lanes, by lanes, nooks and corners of Kodai Canal. And Padmanabhan tells me, in my life I have made so many trips to Kodai Canal, I have taken Swami for a drive so many places, but there are streets and routes which I don't know. But Swami said, go like this, go here, go left from here, go right from here. And then, Swami himself completed the story. And he said, look, Kodai Canal is a cold place. It's a hilly place. There's no mode of transport there except that you have to walk. Any hill station, you need to walk. The people who are really old, the people who are really infirm, the people who really need who are poor, would have found it difficult to come here. And they wouldn't have got the blankets. So what I did was, I went round, found those people and gave them blankets. So as he was going round and round, whenever he would see an old person, whenever he would see a poor person, He would stop the car and then say, give him a blanket. So somebody would get down from the jeep, give a blanket and then it would continue. This process continued, Swami went round and round and round to every nook and corner till Swami had to be assured that the blankets were over. In fact, Swami went to the extent of asking, are there any more blankets lying there? No, Swami, we have picked up every single blanket, now everything is over. Then reluctantly said, okay, then let's go back. So here was Swami giving a new meaning to service. All of us would be very happy to serve, to donate to whoever comes to our doorstep. Whoever has come, depending on my capacity, I will give. But here was Swami who was telling us, it's not enough to give whoever has come. If the really needy, the really poor have not come, I will go out in search of them. I will go out, I will seek them and give them. So here was Swami who is teaching once again, nothing is wrong, nothing has gone wrong. I am upset, not because you have done something, not because you have done something stupid. You keep doing it all the time. I am upset because the purpose of my Narayan Seva was to give Blankets to poor and needy people. So if that purpose has not been achieved, I need to find a way of ensuring that that purpose is achieved. Since none of you are capable of finding a way, I will find a way. And now now that I have found a way, now that I have distributed all the blankets, now my thirst is quenched. So my real thirst is for the people. My real thirst is for the needy, for the downtrodden. My real thirst 
is for humanity at large, not me, my family, my people, my and mine. And he showed this all the way to the end of his life. You'll really have to tell me when I, when I need to stop. My problem is I've been a teacher for a little too long. They say a teacher likes to listen to his own voice. Okay. That's also because usually students don't listen, so the teacher likes to listen to his own voice. So I'll just go on and on. You'll have to stop me. So here was Swami teaching us and continued to teach us all his life till the very end. I remember one occasion, it must have been 2007 or 2008. This was the portico in Puttaparthi. That is the veranda of the mandir where in those days you would find some of the students, the teachers and some of the other elders, the so-called VIPs or office bearers would be sitting. So here was Swami coming, he had started coming in a chair for darshan. So he would be wheeled in that chair. So Swami came, was, was wheeled in that chair. Here was this old devotee. Uh, I've seen him around for at least 40-50 years. So when Swami came up to him, Swami was clearly, his health was not very good that day. That was a very apparent from the form. You take Namaskar, his feet were swollen. Swami came, stopped in front of this gentleman who was from the US, who had settled down in the US. Swami stopped, he took Namaskar. That was when he saw, when we saw. I was sitting a little bit, just three, four people away from him. It was like a, he was sitting here, I was sitting perpendicular. So I could hear the conversation. So Swami stopped there and this man asked whether he can take Namaskar. So Swami signaled, yes, he can take Namaskar. So Swami's robe was covering his feet, sitting on the chair. So he just pushed the robe, pulled, pulled up the robe a little bit and you know, touched Swami's feet. That was when we noticed that Swami's feet were really swollen that day. So he must have been in pain. And he lovingly asked him, how's your mother? So my mother is okay here and then. Swami made a lot of inquiries about his mother's health and so on. So then, being a very old devotee who's probably been around from the, I guess from the 60s, if not the 70s at least. So he could take the liberty, he said, Swami... Swami is in so much pain and Swami is inquiring so much about my mother. And Swami's answer was really revealing. He said, when you think of other people's pain, and that brings me to conclude that Swami must have been in so much of pain that day. When you think of other people's pain, your pain goes away. But that was a lesson which I myself came across almost 10 years before this incident. Not 10 years, maybe 13, 14 years before this incident. The year was 1994. It was the month of May, the beginning of May. Swami was in Vrindavan at that time. I don't know how many of you would remember or would know that Swami had a fall at that time and uh, his right shoulder was injured. So he had literally pulled the right shoulder and therefore this was immobile. His hand was like this. He didn't come down for darshan for a few days. What had happened was uh, Shivratri of 1994, when I went to Puttaparthi for Shivratri, uh, my mother told me, I'm feeling a little heavy in the chest. I'm not feeling very fine. When I walk up a slope, I feel heaviness, the typical symptoms of, you know, a cardiac problem. Feel heaviness when I walk up the steps, if I walk too much or if I walk up that slope. And it's a very mild slope, not a very heavy slope, the slope behind Ganesha. If I walk up that slope, by the time I reach our room, I feel very suffocated. So as an educated person, she also understood, I also understood, it's a typical cardiac problem, a blockage. So, I said, shall we go for a checkup? She said, no, you tell Swami about it. 
So all she wanted was for me to tell Swami. For a devotee, once you tell, tell Swami, you put the problem at Swami's feet, your problem is over. At least that is the attitude which he has cultivated. Your problem may or may not be over, but if you have handed over your problem to him, and if you have surrendered to him, then he takes care. He takes care not necessarily solving the problem. He takes care in the sense that he does what is right for you. The common mistake people make is, they think that when he takes care, everything should be fine. Being Sai devotee is not a passport to a problem-free life. Being a Sai devotee gives you the strength to handle all the problems that life will throw at you. Or, if I can take the liberty of saying, he gives you the strength to handle all the problems that he throws at you. Because he throws those problems at you only so that you grow. I began by saying, he tries to lift us up a few steps in the process of evolution. It is only then when we gather the strength to handle those problems, do we really climb up the ladder of evolution. He says, pleasure is an interval between two pains. He never said pain is an interval between two pleasures. So, fortunately, by then we had come to the stage of saying, let's put the problem to Swami, then it's left to him. Obviously, with that Shivratri crowd and Shivratri celebrations and our being in Puttapati for one day, I couldn't have told Swami. I didn't even try to give a letter to Swami. By then it was known, or Swami had dropped enough hints that he is coming to Vrindavan in a few days. Sorry, not 1994, 2004. He is coming to Vrindavan in a few days. So I told my mother, I said, when Swami comes to Vrindavan, he said, yeah, yeah, when Swami comes to Vrindavan, once again, I thought, Swami comes to Vrindavan, that's my place. I'll get a lot of chance to tell Swami. Swami came to Vrindavan soon enough. Within a week of that incident, he came to Vrindavan. My mother also followed. So we are having morning, evening darshan. I'm seeing Swami every day, morning, evening, at least twice, if not more. The beauty is, one week passed, ten days passed, two weeks passed. I never got a chance to tell Swami of this problem. It's not that Swami was treating me like a pillar or a flower pot around. He was talking to me, he was looking at me, he was smiling at me. But he never gave me a chance to tell this. Two weeks passed, now I'm getting frustrated. Because I'm not getting a chance. I can understand if Swami was ignoring me. He's not ignoring me, he's talking to me. With Darshan time, he's passing from me. He's taking a kerchief out of my hands, smiling and giving me back the kerchief, but not giving me an opening to say this. Finally, a couple of weeks later, I got a chance in Trai Vrindavan when there didn't seem to be anybody else in the room. Swami was there, there was another gentleman there and I was there. So I said, I'll tell Swami, whatever work was there, work was over. So he was sitting there, Swami was reading letters. So I waited for a pause and soon enough, Swami, he was reading a letter, stopped, looked at me. And I said, Swami, Swami, hear me. What? So I started selling. I said, Swami, Mother, Ku. Don't worry, he said. I have not said anything. I said, Swami, Mother, Ku. I paused. He finished that letter and he is sitting there. So again I started. I said, Swami, Mother is feeling... We always like to think that God should react the, in the way in which we want Him to react. That's a mistake we make. So here I was counting my life by years. If you count your life by years, you've not learned anything. You've not lived a life worth living. So I was counting my life by years. I've stayed at Swami's feet for a quarter of a century. You stayed at Swami's feet for a quarter of a century but learned nothing. I was out to prove that, that day. So, third time, I said, Swami, uh, Mother is saying that uh, whenever she walks around, she feels some blockage. 
ఏం ప్రాబ్లం లేదు డోంట్ వరీ బట్ ఈ కంటిన్యూ టు లుక్ ఎట్ మీ సో అగైన్ ఐ టుక్ ఐ సెన్ నో స్వామి ఐ స్పోక్ టు డాక్టర్ దాష్ యాక్చువల్లీ వాట్ ఎట్ హ్యాపన్ వాజ్ ఇన్ దిస్ టూ వీక్స్ స్వామి వుడ్ కమ్ ఫర్ దర్శన్ ద డాక్టర్స్ ఆఫ్ ద హాస్పిటల్ ఆల్సో వుడ్ కమ్ ఫర్ దర్శన్ సో దెర్ వాజ్ దిస్ డాక్టర్ ఇన్ ద హాస్పిటల్ హోమ్ ఓవర్ ద ఇయర్స్ వీ హెట్ కమ్ టు నో వెల్ వన్ ఆఫ్ ద సీనియర్ డాక్టర్స్ ఇన్ ద హాస్పిటల్ so i had spoken to him his name is dr dash even today he is there he's one of the prominent doctors in the hospital so i had spoken to him and i told him i said doctor this is what he also said he said yeah these are typical symptoms what's her age she was 74 at that time i said so i'm doctor she is 74 he said yeah so with age you bring her to the hospital i said no not bringing her to the hospital we first going to tell swami so and then depending on what swami says we'll do he said okay you want me to tell swami i said no no doctor you are not telling swami i am telling swami when you tell swami then i should i should have told swami so i said you don't you're not going to open your mouth you're not going to tell swami i had to caution him i said you're not going to tell swami i am going to tell swami after that you no guys okay so i said uh, swami i spoke to dr dash and dr dash said he again he didn't allow me to complete the sentence doctors urke cheptadu i hope there's no doctor in this audience డాక్టర్స్ ఊరికే చెప్తాడు హీస్ నాట్ అలాయింగ్ మీ టు కంప్లీట్ ద స్టోరీ బై దెన్ హీ హెడ్ పిక్ట్ అప్ అన్ అదర్ లెటర్ బట్ దెన్ దిస్ టైమ్ ఐ వాజ్ నాట్ ఐ వాజ్ రిఫ్యూజింగ్ టు టేక్ ద హింట్ సో ఐ నో అట్ హోమ్ ఇఫ్ సంబడీ టెల్స్ యూ సంథింగ్ యూ నో విత్ ఇన్ ద ఫ్యామిలీ విల్ సే నో నో నాట్ లైక్ దాట్ ఆర్ యూ హ్యావ్ అ క్లోజ్ ఫ్రెండ్ and no, no no it's not like that it's like this you stupid fellow you don't understand it's not like that it's like this so that attitude this time when swami said doctor zoor ke cheptado i waited for a chance to open my mouth and again as he was picking up the letter he looked at me i should have kept quiet i should have folded my hands i should have taken namaskar i should have said something instead of that i said with that vehemence which i said no swami it's not like that and So Swami looked at me. I didn't realize that Swami is looking at me with a, that look. I continued. I told my whole story now. Because I had rehearsed that story for two weeks. What am I going to tell Swami when I get a chance? So I have rehearsed that story for two weeks. I am going to tell Swami this, this, this. So now that I have got a chance, I said, Atla kaadu Swami. I literally said that. I said, Swami, Atla kaadu. By now I have learned enough Telugu to... I, still, I would still speak in broken Telugu to Swami, but I had learned enough to... try and manage that broken telugu so i said swami atla kadu swami swami atla and i continued telugu hindi english whatever came but i completed my story this time he allowed me to say what i wanted to say so he was looking at me i didn't realize that i was not even looking at his face i was just because my rehearsed story have i said everything completely so i was repeating my rehearsed story so i was not looking at his face when i finished then i looked up and then i realized he was looking at me all the time and that expression was not i had now finished my story so anything else you want to say <laughs> that he didn't say that but that kind of look okay anything else there's nothing else now what to do so then i finally the only refuge you have is fold your hands so i folded my hands till then i had not even folded my hands because i was so vehement so i was saying so now i folded my hands then swami you know in literally kind of you know that tone of pity Uh, okay go to the hospital tomorrow meet dr dash get check up done fine so i got what i wanted i thought i wanted to surrender to swami's feet i thought i had deluded myself into thinking that if i put the problem to swami that's enough but if that was really so when first time when swami said no problem don't worry etc i should have dropped the matter my subconscious mind did not drop the mind drop the matter because in my subconscious mind i wanted god to react i thought he was god but i wanted god to react in the way i thought he should react so i was scripting a response for him anyway i'm running out of time i'll cut the long story short we went next day to the hospital got test done anybody who's made the mistake or had the misfortune to go into hospital will know these tests go on and on so we went on for three days at the end of the third day i was really feeling i shouldn't have not, by now i realized 
I forced Swami to send me to the hospital. He taught me the hard way. If I had kept quiet, Swami would have taken care. So, at the end of the third day, Dr. Dash said, finally, of course, he was being extra cautious because Swami had sent the patient. He wanted to do all kinds of tests which are even remotely, you know, would you mind remotely reveal some problem. So, he undertook everything under the sun. And then he said, okay, these tests are over. The report will come tomorrow morning. So, now I asked him, I said, do I need to bring my mother tomorrow morning? Because I had pulled that 74-year-old lady three days up and down, whole day to the hospital. So, I said, do I need to bring the, my mother tomorrow morning? No. He said, come in the evening. I said, no, evening, I'll come tomorrow morning. Because my mind was evening darshan time. I said, I'll come tomorrow morning. He said, okay. In, do I need to bring my mother? So, he understood. He said, no, no, don't trouble her. You come. We will look at the test results. And then we will decide what course of action. We will tell Swami because now the case has gone to Swami. Swami had already also spoken to Dr. Dash about it. So now that the case has gone to Swami, we will tell Swami about it. If necessary, I will speak to your mother when, when I come for darshan. Uh, after darshan, I will speak to her there only in the hall. I said, okay, very nice of you. Next day morning, I will go. Next day, Swami had this fall and he had injured this. So Dr. Dash said, this is what the condition is. Uh, given a rage, I don't think we should do any intervention, any surgery or anything of that kind. I think we should be able to manage it with medicines. So we'll put her on medication. I said, no. You tell Swami that or I'll tell Swami that. And if Swami says, we'll take medicines, fine. But now nobody could tell Swami. Neither could Dr. Dash tell Swami nor could I tell Swami because Swami had fallen. We didn't even want to tell Swami. And he was not coming for darshan. So few days passed, no darshan, both of us forgot about it. He also said, he said, it's not a critical case. I said, doctor, don't even think of telling Swami. Even if you get a chance, don't tell Swami now. When Swami is perfectly fine, we'll tell him. After one month, we'll tell him. He said, yeah, yeah, it's not, it's not a critical case. Don't worry. So, we have forgotten. About 10 days later, Swami had not given darshan. About 10 days later, this was now the first week of May. It was announced that Swami would give darshan to everybody on Ishwaramma Day. Everybody, students, teachers. It was holidays time, so there were very few students teachers, whoever is staying, including devotees, he would give darshan on Ishwarama day from the balcony. And then I learned that that day afternoon, Swami had come down. Swami would stay on the first floor of Trai Vrindavan. So I learned that Swami had come down. And Swami had spent some time talking to some of the elders down. So next day, I thought, I can, I can walk into Trai Vrindavan, so let me go. So next day I walked in. I said, yesterday Swami has come and He has announced that uh, He will give darshan to devotees on Ishwara Mahade. That means today also He will come down. I said, let me go down. Out of pure this thing of see how Swami is. And if somebody in your family is sick, you will go and see Him. If you haven't seen a loved one who is sick, you will feel odd. You will call every day. If you are in another city, you will call every day, twice a day, thrice a day. So here we were living in Vrindavan. We knew Swami had a fall. We knew Swami had injured His hand. Swami had not given darshan for 10 days. We were getting you know, driblets of information from Trai Vrindavan. So naturally, everybody was curious. In fact, we would go and sit in Trai Vrindavan lawns or on those benches there every morning, every evening, hoping we'll get a glimpse of Swami. So next day, I said, okay, quietly, let me go in. I've got that opportunity, let me go in. I walked in and then I was told that Swami was already down and he was sitting in the interview room. So there were three elders, the same three people with whom he had spent some time the previous day, he said, these three people, um, the people who look after things in Trai Vrindavan, Mr. Bhutia said, these three people are sitting there in the interview room, Swami is talking to them. I said, okay, so I waited, there's a round hall, I waited in that round hall, in one corner. I said, sooner or later, Swami will come out. After about half an hour, the interview room door opens and Swami comes out. So here was Swami, I don't know if I can use the word walking. His hand was like this. There was an orange shawl draped around. And all of us will know if even one part of our body is not functioning normally, we would find it difficult. When all parts are functioning normally, we don't realize. But when something is not functioning normally, you realize how critical it is. So here was Swami, one hand tied like this, wearing that long flowing robe. So with the other hand catching the robe and therefore finding it difficult to walk. So he was literally hobbling along. So there was somebody 
one uh, gentleman by name, by name Satyajit, whom many of you would have seen or heard, who was walking by Swami's side, trying to hold his hand. Fiercely independent that Swami is, he won't give his hand. So Satyajit would try to catch his hand, he would pull the hand and then again catch the robe, or he would try to balance himself with his hand. I mean, that was the precarious condition with, in which he was. And here I realized, I was feeling so bad. I said, why am I here? It's a sight which I wouldn't like to see. I said, this sight is going to give me nightmares. I was wishing that I wasn't here. I had very foolishly gone in there. Just because I, I could walk in and nobody would tell me not to come, I had gone in. So I, I, now I can't even walk out. Because if I move, I'll be noticed. It's a round hall. So I literally pressed myself against the wall, hoping I won't be seen. But the human eye is such that even if you are looking down, if there is somebody standing somewhere, we will notice it. So as Swami came halfway through the hall, he must have noticed me. So he looked up. And as he looked up, I moved forward now that he has looked at me, looked up at me, made eye contact, I moved forward. And I started asking Swami, how is Swami? Even before I could ask, how is Swami? Swami looked up at me and said, How is your mother? Here was Swami in pain himself, hand damaged, paining, wrapped up, can't walk. But the moment he saw me, the first words which came out of his mouth, and very frankly, even you or me will take longer to react. If we see somebody with a family member sick, it might take us 30 seconds to remember that that family member is sick and ask, how is your mother or father? But here was Swami, the moment he saw me, how is your mother? And here I was asking Swami, Swami at Naru, how is your mother? Did you go to the hospital? Were the tests done? What did Dr. Dash say? And simultaneously he is trying to hobble and walk. That is why I narrated that first incident when Swami said, when you think of another person's pain, your pain goes away. So here was Swami who was demonstrating. I really didn't know what to say. And again very foolishly I said, Swami, I just came to see how Swami is. So I am trying to tell Swami, Swami, I have not come here for my mother. I needn't have said that. But I said, Swami, I just came here to see how Swami is. That's okay. What happened to your mother? I just couldn't answer. I answered on only one language which we human beings know and that's the language of tears. My eyes were in tears. I just bent down and took Swami's Namaskar and moved two steps behind. And as I moved two steps behind, Swami said, because I was not answering, Swami said, Dash Kodaktamu. I'll inquire from Dr. Dash. So here was someone who was in pain but was teaching us that I put others before myself. Swami uses the word joy as an acronym and says, you get joy when you put Jesus first, others next, and yourselves last. So here was Swami literally showing us that he was putting himself last. And in the process of putting himself last, he was getting joy though he was in pain. And that is because he was putting the pain of others before his own pain. Here was someone who was a teacher all his life. We are fortunate that we have been his students. His students in different senses of the term. I only hope and pray that we have learnt and we continue to learn the journey that he is trying to push us onto. The steps in the ladder of evolution that he is trying to make us climb. We continue to climb I pray to him to give us the wisdom, to give us the sadbuddhi to move ahead in our journey. Sairam.